All right, everybody. Um, thank you again for being here today. My name is Jay Burney. We're going to have an, a couple of more excellent programs as we move through the afternoon. Uh, I, I want to remind everyone that uh, Birds of Niagara and Birchfield collaboration is part of the partnership that we're doing here today. And once again, if you want to join Birchfield, uh, there's a 10% discount for people that are attending here today. And uh, there's a, a table outside the doors here. We'll be here all afternoon. Uh, so feel free to take advantage of that. Next speaker, uh, someone I know pretty well. Um, some of you know, he shares my last name. Um, he worked for a lot of years in Western New York for the Western New York Land Conservancy. Uh, he has moved on. Um, he's working now for an organization that he's going to talk to us a little bit about. It's called Hokotoko. It's a conservation organization based in Ecuador. And uh, he's moved from saving lands in Western New York, lands that we've all appreciated that he's worked on and the Western New York Land Conservancy has worked on, um, to working in, in some pretty interesting places. Uh, he's working in the Andes, working in the Amazon, and working in the Galapagos. When he first got this job, he, he said to me, you know, if you'd asked me when I was seven years old uh, what I wanted to do with my life, uh, I would have said, yeah, I'm going to save the Galapagos. He did, and I have it on videotape when he was seven years old. So it's a, it's a great memory. Anyway, uh, J. Jean Rose Bernie, um, someone that I know all of you here know, and uh, he's got a great new adventure in life. And J. Jean, please go. Hi, everyone. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is, I think, the seventh bird festival that I've been a part of. Um, and it's cool how each year it grows. And I know a lot of that is because of my dad. And also, one of the reasons why I get to speak every year might have something to do with my dad, too, because I know a guy. Um, so I'm going to talk about this, this organization that I started working for just two and a half months ago uh, called the Hokotoko Conservation Foundation. Um, it, it's this really incredible organization, and among, you know, aside from showing some pretty cool photos, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the connections between what happens in Ecuador and what happens in Western New York. So, how many of you have been to Ecuador? Is a, a show of hands. All right, so not many, only a couple here. You know, I interestingly, I haven't yet been to Ecuador. <laughs> so I started working for Hokotoko two and a half months ago, and um, until maybe, maybe an hour and a half ago, I hadn't even met anyone that I work with in person, but David Agro, one of our board members and founders, is here and will be presenting after me about the Kirtland's Warbler in Ontario. So I'm going to Ecuador for the first time in a week, and, and so I guess a lot of my presentation is obviously about the work that the organization has done well before me. Uh, so I had to Google a lot of this. What do we do? What do we do? Who are we? Um, so Ecuador is a really amazing place. Uh, and this is just a map to give you a sense of where it is between per Peru and Colombia, uh, on the Pacific coast, like my dad said, Andes, Amazon, um, and the Galapagos Islands are part of Ecuador. And, and just an incredible amount of diversity. I think Ecuador, the number of birds that Ecuador has is I think it's 1,700 or very close to 1,700 which for a country that's smaller than most U.S. states, smaller than Arizona, it's smaller than Wyoming, it's smaller than North Dakota, it has more than double the amount of birds that you can find in the U.S. So, just, and the same is true of mammals and reptiles. It's just huge amounts of endemism, birds and species that only exist in Ecuador or in small portions of Ecuador. And, and the founding story for Hokotoko, and so it's spelled with a J, but it's Spanish, so it's pronounced with an H, Hokotoko. Um, so this Hokotoko ant pitta uh, is very, obviously very important. Our, our name comes from this Hokotoko ant pitta. Uh, 25 years ago, I think 1998, uh, an ornithologist and a, and a group of people he was with, so his name was Bob Ridgely, um, and he's a well-known ornithologist. If you go to Ecuador and you buy a bird book, you're going to be buying the Ridgely bird book to, to Ecuador. Um, so he's very well known. And at one point, he was exploring Ecuador, uh, southern mountains in Ecuador, going to a place that not many people had really explored, especially ornithologists, scientists. And they kept hearing this bird, this bird that kind of sounded like an owl, but it wasn't an owl. And, you know, Bob Ridgely knew that it wasn't an owl. So the group of them had walked up this hill. They were in a cloud forest, uh, trying to figure out what it is that they were hearing. And at one point, this bird 
this bird that you're seeing in this photo jumped onto a branch right in front of them, and none of them recognized it. No one had ever seen this before. It wasn't in Bob's book. He wrote the book. It wasn't in the book. Uh, and so they realized pretty quickly that it was a new bird, a new species. Uh, they called it the Hokotoko ant pit. A Hokotoko is kind of sounds like the, the, the song that it sings. Um, and then they also realized that it was in a small patch of forest that was surrounded by agriculture. Most of the cloud forests, most of the forests around this, this place that they were, they were in that day had already been cut. And so they got together because they realized that if they didn't try to protect this one forest, this bird that no one had ever seen before, that was new to science, would also disappear. And that's how Hokotoko, the conservation organization, began. They protected this one forest, and since then, they've done a lot more like that throughout Ecuador. Um, and so I guess a little bit about me, too. So I wanted to say, how did I end up with the Hokotoko Conservation Foundation? How did, how did that happen? You know, so I grew up in Buffalo, in western New York. Um, and I think Beaver Meadow, the Audubon Nature Center, was just a really important part of my life. And this is a photo of me and my parents. Um, I don't know how old I am there, maybe one or two or you know, whatever it is. Uh, but so I grew up basically at Beaver Meadow. My parents were volunteers there on the board. And that really sent me on this sort of journey of environment and birds in particular. Um, in high school, I think it's fair to say that I lost interest in birds. You know, it wasn't, wasn't the most important thing on my mind during high school. Um, in college, I met my wife, who is from Puerto Rico, um, at UB. And um, I accidentally mentioned to her, you know, before we started dating, that I liked bird watching. And usually that wasn't a good pickup line. I like bird watching. So it wasn't something that I led with most of the time. I actually accidentally said it to her and she said, you know, me too. And so immediately we got married. But you know, we, we obviously, you know, it worked out. We had this shared interest in birds. We graduated from UB. We got married. I did a study abroad in Costa Rica. So my interest in tropical conservation, tropical, you know, wildlife, um, I was able to go to Costa Rica. Uh, do a study abroad there uh, through the University of Buffalo and Bob Shibley and into Schneekloth. I was able to teach there um, after working at the Urban Design Project with Bob and, Bob and Linda for a few years after grad school. Uh, my wife and I, we went to Peace Corps in Mexico um, and I did bird conservation work there in a city called Puebla, big you know, wetlands conservation. I met an executive director who's also a volunteer and she was the executive director of a land trust and I hadn't really heard of what land trusts were. And I sort of realized, well, maybe what I want to do is protecting land, protecting wetlands, protecting birds. And so when I came back to Buffalo, I found the West New York Land Conservancy, and Nancy Smith hired me. And Nancy's in the front. Raise your hand, Nancy Smith. So she hired me. This is now a decade ago. Um, and so I worked at the West New York Land Conservancy for more than a decade. And the places that we were able to protect, incredible places, like Stella, a lot of people mentioned it, Gallagly on Grand Island. I think there's some, some tours there for this festival, um, just all throughout Western New York. And a lot of people, who's here from the Western New York Land Conservancy right now? I think we're about, we're about 25% of the room. But, <laughs> and, there, and, and I, won't, I won't steal your thunder, Mark, because I know you're going in an hour, so I won't, I won't you know, talk too much about the Land Conservancy, but an awesome organization. But I'd always wanted to do tropical conservation. And uh, three, four months ago, I was looking for new work. I moved to DC, my wife started a federal job down there, and I found the Hokotoko Conservation um, Foundation. Um, and the very, my introduction to Hokotoko, my very first week, so this was first week of December last year, not that long ago, uh, I was writing our annual letter. So the last letter that goes out, it's a fundraising letter, and one of the stories that my, my new boss, Martin Schaefer, asked me to write about was our work on the Galapagos. And I'll, I'll get into that actual work later, but what was really cool was it was maybe like, I was calling one of our staff members, who's leading this, basically an island rewilding project, one of the Galapagos Islands. Um, I was calling, it was at 7.30 at night. I had to do it in Spanish. Uh, Victor Carrion doesn't speak English. He was using WhatsApp. So I was testing the Spanish that I had used in Mexico a decade earlier, but this is the first time I really had to speak Spanish for work uh, in a real way. Um, so I was a little nervous about that. But as I was talking to him and I was understanding what he was saying and he was understanding what I was saying, and he's literally in the Galapagos Islands on this tiny little island with 150 people in the middle of the night. I could hear the breeze in the, in the background, the sea breeze. 
I was just, it just, it just, it just felt like a perfect culmination of what I wanted to do with my life. And like my dad said, at seven years old, I would have said that that's what I wanted to do. So, um, so a little bit more about Hoko Toko. We are uh, an organization, we're Ecuadorian. Um, we have 15 reserves. We protect 80,000 acres on those 15 reserves. We help manage another 200,000 acres of other private and communal reserves. And these are in places like the Amazon and the Andes, um, even the Galapagos, uh, and, and places I hadn't really heard of, but very important biologically, like the Choco or the Tumbes. Um, let me see if I have some details here. But we, so in terms of birds in Ecuador, it's like 1,700. Birds on our reserves alone, it's almost 1,100 birds just on our reserves, on, that, on those 15 reserves. Uh, we do species reintroductions. We do habitat restoration. Uh, we helped create and create the management plan for a new marine protected area that connects the Galapagos to the Cocos Islands in, in Costa Rica. So the, the amount of work that we do is, is really phenomenal. Um, and, and this is a map of the reserves that we own. Uh, and you can see it's, it's spread out. Quito's sort of in the middle there. Uh, you know, the main capital city in the Andes. We have reserves up north, south, on the coast, um, and the one in the Galapagos. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, what's really, really cool about Hokotoko is it's like every year they're discovering new species that hadn't been, been seen yet. Um, they're bringing species back that are on the brink of extinction. And, and they're finding species that they thought were already extinct. So this photo is uh, the horned marsupial frog. Um, and it's on one of our reserves called Cannon Day. This is in the Choco. It's very wet, cloud forest, tropical lowlands. Uh, but this frog we thought was extinct until very recently we found it again. Um, and so this happens a lot. This is just one of the prettier, in, more interesting photos. Um, but the horned marsupial frog, you know, discovered on a reserve that we protected and everyone had already thought that it had disappeared. Science really guides what we do. Uh, we, we listen to science, we collect evidence, we collect data, that's how we make our, our conservation decisions. So this is a spectacled bear uh, on another one of our reserves. Just recently we began um, uh, tagging spectacled bears with uh, radio collars so that we can figure out where they actually go, what their life cycle looks like. We know that they're on our reserves, but where else do they go? What kind of decisions can we make? What should we be doing to protect them throughout their life cycle? Where are they most threatened? What are the, the problems they have? Where do they breed? And so by you know, attaching radio collars to these spectacle bears, and I got this, you know, I'm on this WhatsApp group with Hoko Toko staff, and so every day I'm getting photos like this of what's going on in Ecuador. Um, so this is just last week I got these photos, and these are spectacle bears. This is some of our staff, some staff from uh, a, a, a university that's helping with the project. Um, and the point is we're trying to figure out, using science, where these bears go, how to protect them beyond our reserves. And we also really listen to communities. We, we rely a lot on community leadership, so science and communities drive our decisions. This is a reserve called Ajampe, which is on the Pacific coast. Originally, we protected this reserve because there was a rare, I think it's a hummingbird, a rare hummingbird that used the habitat here. Um, but the, the local community, the people that we hire to manage our reserves, and this is Byron Delgado, who is the, the I guess, the main um, reserve manager. Um, you know, he's from that community, and he was telling us, you know, the hummingbird is important, obviously, the habitat's important for this hummingbird, but the beach on this reserve is a really important nesting site for sea turtles. And so through his work, he, he basically transformed this beach into a place where sea turtles nest but were really threatened and were really declining to a place where over the course of I think just 10 years, 10 times the number of sea turtles are now nesting and 100 times the number of sea turtle uh, hatchlings are reaching the ocean. And it's because of working with the community, his daughter, uh, you know, as an ambassador for this work. She helps with the sea turtle monitoring. She goes to her school. She tells people how important these, these, these sea turtles are. And so the communities really rallied together around protecting these sea turtles, making sure they're safe. And now it's a, it's a place where people from all over Ecuador go and visit to see the sea turtles, whereas 10 years ago, the sea turtles were really threatened, being harmed, and really rarely making it to the ocean. All four sea turtles, you know, all four of the endangered sea turtles nest, nest here. And that photo, that's Byron lying in the track of a leatherback sea turtle, the largest sea turtle. Um, we also realized, I think, you know, we were founded on basically protecting reserves, uh, and a lot of that was based on birds or very special species or ecosystems that only existed on those reserves. 
but we realized that the reserves themselves, if they're gonna be healthy, we have to think beyond the reserves, beyond the borders of the reserves. We have to think about ecological corridors. We have to think about buffering national parks. We have to think about working with communities um, that have their own reserves and how best to manage those reserves and expanding the reserves. So we've created five different regional programs. I'll go over them quickly, you know, it's a lot, a lot of details, but five different regional programs where we're focusing our work expanding reserves, linking reserves. It's a lot like the Western New York Wildway idea. It's the same concept. We're trying to connect these places so that wildlife can roam across the landscape so you can protect all the different life stages of the wildlife. And then obviously there's benefits to people too. You know, the water that people in Ecuador drink come from places in our reserves, from the mountains. You know, all of these services that these natural places provide are a big part of also why we, we protect them. Um, so this is called Podocarpus el Condor. Uh, this is down in southern Ecuador. And, you know, briefly, el Condor is a mountain range that's actually older than the Andes. Um, and so there's, there's really cool, you know, diversity of habitats here. This is the Tapichalaca Reserve, which is where the Hokotoko Antpita was first found. So cloud forests uh, on a mountain. Um, and Tapichalaca is large, it's 10,000 acres, more or less. Uh, this is a smaller preserve, um, the Copalinga Preserve, and this is more lowland rainforest. So just giving you some photos, ideas of what, what it is we do. Um, the, the Choco is this really phenomenal place that basically extends from Panama, it's on the, you know, the Pacific side of the Andes, Panama, Colombia, into Ecuador. Very wet, very diverse, a lot of endemic species but also very threatened. So in Ecuador, in 1938, most of this Choco region was forested. Almost 100% of it was forested. By 1980, I think the number was down to like only 5% was left. And today, only 3% of the forest are left. So this is agriculture and palm oil plantations and mining and logging too that has basically cut most of these forests. Um, and so we have our largest reserve is in, in this area. Um, and this is, the, the reserve is called Kanande. This, this photo is not from Kanande, but Kanande, this reserve in the Choco, is home to the only viable, you know, healthy population of jaguars left in western Ecuador. We also work in the Galapagos. So the Galapagos are part of Ecuador, and we do a lot of work in the Galapagos. We have a reserve there. Um, the reserve is, is basically we protected it because of the Galapagos petrel nests on this reserve. Um, we've helped create a new marine reserve that connects the Galapagos to the Cocos Island in Costa Rica. And I'll get into it uh, towards the end, but we're also doing this really cool rewilding project on one of the islands in the Galapagos. And this is, I'm just throwing this in here to give you a sense of, you know, whale sharks are, are cool, and so it's a pretty photo. Um, we work also in the, what's, what's, this is the Andes Napo. So from the high Andes down into the lowland Amazon rainforests, we'd work there too. We have a couple of reserves in this region, one up in the mountains and one big one down in the, the Amazon. Um, and so this is a photo of our Narupa Reserve. So this is Amazonian rainforest, um, pretty incredible. And then this is in that same region, uh, you know, volcano not on our reserve, but adjacent to one of our reserves up in the highlands. This is called the Antisana Volcano, but this is right next to our Chicana Reserve. Um, and the Chicana Reserve is, is basically, they call it Paramo, which is like high elevation montane grasslands, like uh, mountain meadows. Uh, and this is a, an Andean fox on, on our reserve. Um, and then the last regional uh, area that we, we've prioritized is called the Chumbes region. And Chumbes is a combination of Choco and Tumbes. So Choco is very wet, Tumbes is very dry, tropical dry forests, forests in the tropics that actually lose their leaves during the dry season, so tropical deciduous forest. And this is a part of Ecuador where the two combine. Um, and there's also a, a, a river that carves through this region that's created this really deep gorge. And so those different factors have sort of like created these islands in the sky where different species have evolved over, you know, millennia, hundreds of thousands of years to be separate, to be, in, you know, endemic rare species that only exist here. Um, and this, so the Buenaventura Reserve is 10,000 acres in this region. It's rainforest, some cloud forest. Uh, and this is where we get into some of the restoration work that we do. So in, in the course of 25 years, we've planted 1.7 million trees. And it's always local trees, locally collected seeds. We use our own greenhouses. We grow them on our reserves. We grow them in communities that want you know, to plant trees. Um, on this Buenaventura Reserve, when we first purchased it, 
Uh, you know, it's an important place. There's a few species that exist there, birds, an oral parakeet that exists here. And you know, so protecting it was sort of the impetus of protecting this Buenaventura Reserve was the, the, the parakeet and a few other species that exist there. But a lot of Buenaventura, like all of the land around it, had already been cut and like overgrazed. It was pasture. And so with Buenaventura, although there was forest left, some of it was already degraded. So 25 years ago, we started replanting the forest in Buenaventura. And what they're finding now, only 25 years later, so like one human generation, that the places that we started planting 25 years ago already have the same diversity of wildlife that you know an Amazon old growth rainforest would have. So it grew back quickly. It's not old growth, it's 25 years old. But this photo is of what used to be overgrazed pasture. Um, so it's an, also just an incredible part of what we do, and I think it connects a little bit to what David Agro is going to talk about next, which is you know restoration and how you can bring back species by by thinking about restoring what was lost. Um, and then this I just thought was an awesome photo. So this is a reserve called the Cerro de Arcos, um, a relatively new reserve. Uh, it's a thousand acres. This. I mean, when I was in high school, I played The Legend of Zelda, and this just reminds me of uh, the you know Link run, uh, riding his his horse through the the meadows. And um, but this is high elevation Andean mountain meadow. It's really cool. Um, and so I'm going to do a series of just photos for a minute, just to, you know some of the best photos I could find on our our drive over the last couple of weeks. I haven't yet been there, so none of these are mine. Um, and I, yeah, well, I'll go through some of the photos. Um, so black and chestnut eagle in our Yanacocha Reserve, uh, the chestnut-breasted coronet on our Tapichilaca Reserve, uh, the Andean guan, again on the, the Yanacocha Reserve, uh, the rainbow star frontlet, so I'm, I'm still learning the names of these birds, uh, the blue-necked tanager at the Canandé Reserve, again this is in the, the Choco, the buff-fronted owl in the, the Harupe Reserve, Andean ibis. Honestly, I'd never heard of Andean ibis until I, I saw this photo. I think it was Wednesday, and I decided to throw this in here. Uh, the coppery-chested jacamar, uh, the long-waddled umbrella bird. Um, and so, again, I could have done, you know, for a long time, just showing photos of really cool tropical birds that you can see down in, in Ecuador. And I'm going again in a week. I'm pretty excited about it. I, you know, I'm going to see probably two or 300 life birds just without... Uh, Without, <laughs> without doing a lot of hiking. Um, but we also, so in addition to just these awesome birds that are there, you know, we work a lot to save birds from extinction. So I'm focusing more on the birds today because of the birds of Niagara. Um, but we do a lot of work to save birds from extinction. So the great green macaw, an endangered uh, large parrot, large macaw, um, we you know, collaborated with a group to, to introduce, well, they, they was, did a captive breeding program. We, we brought 14 great green macaws back to our uh, Ajampe Reserve. Um, the Andean condor, so, you know, like the California condor, well, not quite as rare, but pretty rare, declining, huge bird in the Andes. Um, there's maybe 140 or 150 in all of Ecuador. On one of our reserves, the Chicana Reserve, so one of these high elevation paramo, these, these you know, mountain grassland reserves, uh, we saw one day 40 of them. So that's, what's the percentage? Almost 30% of all of the Andean condors in Ecuador use this one reserve of ours. And I know a few groups uh, were down there last week and they saw them. I know uh, Alec Human is down in Ecuador with the BOS group this week. I don't know if they've seen the, uh, the Andean condor, but the, you know, it's, it's so 30 or 40% of all the Andean condors in Ecuador are supported by one of our reserves. The blue-throated hill star. So this is a, a, a bird that was discovered, that wasn't even known about until 2017, and maybe 100 individuals are left. Uh, and at the, so this is why we then protected the Cerro de Arcos uh, Reserve, because this is where most of those 100 individuals were. Um, it's critically endangered, and, and really cool, it, it nests in caves. So it's like, it only, like, you know, I was just seeing the photos, but they're finding, and it's the nesting season seems to have just started maybe two or three weeks ago. All the photos are flooding my phone. But they nest in caves. It almost looks like a swallow nest when I look at it. So I've never heard of a hummingbird nesting in caves, but these, these hummingbirds nest in caves. There's maybe 100 of them left, and this one reserve has a, a large portion of the population. This is the El Oro parakeet. So this is another very rare endangered bird. Um, first identified in the 1980s, 
very few left. If you look at the eBird you know, distribution maps, basically one of our reserves has them and then one other small spot further north. So there's just very, there aren't many left and, and we have them at the Buenaventura Reserve, which is one of the reasons we protected the Buenaventura Reserve to you know, protect the El Oro Parakeet. They've been disappearing mostly because they nest in tree cavities. You know, you need kind of old trees, old growth trees that have cavities. Trees start dying, they have cavities, and they, these birds will nest in those tree cavities. Because most of the forest in this area has been cut, well, there's no trees, there's no tree cavities, and there's certainly no old growth. So this reserve is like one of the last homes where these birds can nest. But even in our reserve, we had to create nesting boxes because there still aren't enough tree cavities. So by creating these nesting boxes, we've brought back the population of El Oro parakeets. It's still endangered, but the population is growing. Um, and one of the things that we're doing at Buenaventura as well is we've realized that climate change is really impacting this bird. So in these mountains, you can see climate change. You know, over the course of a couple of years, you can see this happening. I was in Costa Rica, similar you know, habitat, cloud forest, mountains, 10 years ago, and I was, you know, do a lot of bird watching. I went back this year, and I saw a lot of birds that were lowland rainforest birds higher up in the mountains. You know, I saw maybe 10 or 15 birds in Monteverde in Costa Rica this summer that weren't there 10 years ago, and it's because they've moved up the mountains. Cloud forest is moving up the mountains. The, you know, uh, rain and temperature conditions are very special. It's a, if those move up as it gets warmer, that, you know, what makes a cloud forest work moves up the mountain. And hopefully, there's enough mountains so that by the time it gets to the top, the species can still exist. But eventually, and unfortunately, you might have cloud forests no longer have space on these mountains. And the species that exist with those cloud forests disappear too. So what we're doing at Buenaventura with the, the El Oro parakeet is we're buying land further up the mountain, further up the mountain, further up the mountain, because the El Oro parakeet's moving up the mountain at maybe 100 meters per decade is what they're, they're measuring. And so as it moves up the mountain, the forest needs to be there for the El Oro parakeet to survive. And at the top part of the mountain, it's all been deforested. So we're buying land above our reserve, higher elevation land, pastures, reforesting it so that in 25 years or 50 years, that will be the forest of the El Oro parakeet when climate change catches up to the top of the mountain. And then, so this is Galapagos. So this is the Galapagos petrel, another endangered seabird. Um, they only nest in the Galapagos, they feed all around the Galapagos, um, but they only nest in the Galapagos, so it's endemic to the Galapagos, and, and very threatened. You know, the Galapagos you know, has a lot of different things that have, have harmed the wildlife there, but introduced predators are a big part of it. So these birds nest on the ground in caves or in holes, so if you have rats or mice, they're really, you know, they, they really uh, damage the populations of, of these birds. So this is what it looks like when they're nesting, very susceptible to like I said, introduced rats. Um, and this is what we, we radio collared some Galapagos petrels to see where they feed. Uh, but again, they only nest in the Galapagos. They feed in the Pacific around the Galapagos. They eat little uh, squid and fish. Um, and, uh, but we protected a reserve where the Galapagos petrels nest, and then we can manage what's happening at that reserve to protect those nests. This is a bird that is a little bit less charismatic. It's called the pale-headed uh, brush, brush finch. And um, we protected a place, it's the only place that we can find it anymore. So the, the pale-headed brush finch only exists in this Yungia reserve, a place that we protected for the pale-headed brush finch. Um, and over the course of, I think, it's like 10 years, we, through our conservation work, have been able to increase its population by five times. Um, at one point, I think when we were, we were working to protect the land, there were estimates that like, it was 90% likely to go extinct, just given the number of the birds that were left, given the habitat, given the threats around it. So in that amount of time, a relatively short amount of time, we've increased its population by five times. And then I sort of, in terms of the conservation work, this is the story I want to end with. This is the work that we're doing on the Galapagos on an island called, called Floriana. So Floriana is the sixth largest island in the Galapagos. Um, you know, I'm sure you all know what the Galapagos are, you know, islands where species evolution, Darwin's origin of species, I mean, this is where that, that comes from. Um, and on Floriana, uh, like the other Galapagos islands, there were a lot of species there that only existed, one in the Galapagos, and two only existed on Floriana. Um, you know, the Galapagos are far enough from the mainland where when animals or wildlife or plants get there, they can't go back, and so there's not, like, you know, breeding. 
so they become different species. But even within the islands of the Galapagos, they're sometimes far enough away that species land on the islands and they become different from that species on the, the other islands around the Galapagos. Um, so on this island, uh, a lot of the, the wildlife has disappeared. Um, the Galapagos, there was a, a subspecies of the giant tortoise called the Floriana giant tortoise. Uh, it was hunted out. Pirates and whalers ate all the Floriana giant tortoises, so we thought. Um, and then when people settled the island, today there's 150 people that live there, they brought with them rats and mice, and the rats and mice then ate all of the ground nesting birds, all the Darwin's finches, uh, uh, all the birds that you can see here disappeared mostly because of the introduced rats and mice. So lava gull, Galapagos hawk, Floriana mockingbird, the Brujo flycatcher. You know, these are, these are species that were endemic to the, the Galapagos and some of them only to Floriana. Um, maybe 20 years ago, I don't know the exact time, but they realized that there was a giant tortoise on an island nearby that actually had the genetics mostly of the Floriana giant tortoise. So they realized that at one point, the whalers and the pirates captured these giant tortoises, moved to another island, released these giant tortoises so they would have giant tortoises to eat on another island. And now 150 years later, the Floriana giant tortoise still exists. 20 years ago, they started a, a captive breeding program. They are in, I think at the end of this year, they're gonna reintroduce the giant tortoise to Floriana. We have been over the last maybe 10 years, but it, it, very much so in the last year, getting rid of all the introduced predators, the rats and the mice. Once the giant tortoise is in place and establishes itself, all of the things that it does to make the ecosystem healthy, it eats vegetation, it disperses seeds, will make it possible for us to reintroduce uh, its 10 other species of birds, five of the Galapagos finches, all the birds that you see here, um, and a snake that was endemic. Some of these, these birds and the snake only exist now on these tiny little islands off the coast where the rats and the mice couldn't get to. So we're bringing back this life to this island in the Galapagos that has been gone for generations. Um, and I, you know, that, that was the very first thing that I got to work on. I got to talk to, to someone who was doing that project. It was just really phenomenal. Um, so how are we connected? I think the, the, the most obvious answer is, is migration. This, and I'll just show a few examples of birds that we have here that also, you know, we have in Ecuador. Um, these birds will either migrate through here in the spring or fall, or they'll nest here, but they spend their winters in places like Ecuador. Broadwing hawk's a good example. I, you know, I used to do the Hamburg hawk watch, and broadwing hawks would come up there in the spring. You know, those same broadwing hawks spend their winters in the tropics in places like Ecuador. The common night hawks, the same thing. They pass through here, but they also go to Ecuador. So right now, if you're in Ecuador, you can see common night hawks, you can see broadwing hawks. We, uh, one of the presentations earlier, the stamp presentation, talked a lot about cerulean warblers. And cerulean warbler, you know, 10 nesting pairs on the uh, Tanawanda Seneca uh, nation land. They also nest at Iroquois. And um, they're very rare. I mean, if I see a cerulean warbler, it's a, it's a good day. You know, you, I go seek out cerulean warblers in western New York. You get lucky if you see one during migration. Uh, but in Ecuador and some of our reserves, we have cerulean warblers. So right now, right today, if you go down to Ecuador, you could see cerulean warblers that could possibly be here come April, come May, when they start nesting up this way. And I could do a whole long list of birds just like that. Um, Scarlet tanager is another one. We'll start seeing those soon. Uh, one of my favorite birds to come through whenever I'm at Forest Lawn in, in you know, early May is seeing scarlet tanagers up in the trees along with all these other warblers. Um, so that's one obvious way that we're connected. Uh, you know, if we don't protect their nesting grounds up here, we'll lose these birds. If we don't protect their migratory routes between here and Ecuador, we'll lose these birds. If we don't protect their wintering grounds in Ecuador, we won't have any more scarlet tanagers. And so then I think maybe this is just sort of a, a, a promotional thing, but we're also connected as people. So Hokotoko has 15 reserves. We have five lodges. We have a tourism agency that helps run our lodges. If you want to visit, it's very easy to visit. I'm going to be going down in a week, and I'm going to be visiting all of our very fancy lodges. It should be fun. A lot of people up here, I think, like I mentioned, Alec Human right now is down in Ecuador with the BOS group. Um, so it's easy to go to Ecuador. It's easy to visit us. Um, and uh, our, our lodges are very nice. So hopefully you get a chance to go. And I think, you know, I mentioned it too, we're obviously connected by climate change. So, you know, we experience climate change up here. Right now the lake ice is non-existent. I think it's at the lowest levels at this time of year than it has been in recorded history. So 
that's a fa that's a climate change. That's an impact of climate change. And in Ecuador, a lot of you know you can see climate change just like that, impacting cloud forests, impacting wildlife, you know, impacting water. Um, so we're we're connected in that way as well. Um, if you want to get more connected with us, you can find us on social media, Hoko Toko. We have Facebook, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn. Visit us in Ecuador or donate. I'm actually a fundraiser, so if you haven't become a member of Hoko Toko, that's where you can do it, hokotokoconservation.org. So thank you. Uh, any questions or any, do we have time or what do we have to do? Yeah, uh, gonna, if you have questions, this is a good time to ask them, but JG, this is your father speaking. Um, what about that state of emergency in Ecuador? Yeah, I mean, so it's true. There's a, you know, recently, uh, maybe in the last five or 10 years, a spike in, it's basically drug trafficking, drug trafficking violence, gang violence, you know, like what you've seen in Mexico, like what you've seen in Colombia. Um, you know, fortunately, like, you know, obviously I'm talking to all of our staff down there. Everyone's safe. Um, our reserves are, are very far from most of what's going on. And, and to some degree, you know, like I lived in Mexico for three years during the, the drug, you know, wars that were going on in Mexico. And there were parts of the country that, you know, I wouldn't want to go to, but most of the country was very safe. And like Mexico, Ecuador, a lot of places in Ecuador are way safer than a lot of places in the U.S. You know, so it's, I mean, the, 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 the reality is true and it's, it is heartbreaking. But also, it's, it's a good place, and the people are good, and the future's bright. Yeah. Thank you. He's always reassured his mother and I that um, <laughs> where we live is more dangerous than a lot of places if you visit. So. Yeah, I wasn't going to say anything bad about Buffalo, but, you know. Uh, anyone have any questions? Well, we're good. We're good, but thank you, J.D. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.